In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Jack Delosa. He's founder of The Entourage. By the age of 27, Jack had created two multi-million dollar businesses. He came out with the book, Unprofessional. He talks about some of the low point in his career. It's really touching stuff, so listen up for that. He also talks about what worked for him and how he grew these businesses. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Jack Delosa. It's an honor and a pleasure. He's the founder of The Entourage. It's Australia's leading business education institution for entrepreneurs and executives under 40. They currently have over 35,000 members. That's, that's pretty amazing, Jack. By the age of 27, Jack had created two multi-million dollar businesses, MBE Education and The Entourage. He shares many of his insights in his book, Go Out and Get It, It's Unprofessional, How a 26-Year-Old University Dropout Became a Self-Made Millionaire. Jack, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it, Jeremy. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to hear your big lessons, big mistakes you learned from your journey, which I know There's you share in the book too. Yeah. <laughs> and what worked, what didn't work. And I want to get into to you, you know, that journey. But first I have to ask, so how'd you come up with the title Unprofessional? Yeah, well, I, I, it's my view that the business world has changed. Uh, I think that in every aspect of business, uh, it's different from how it was in some instances five years ago, but in most instances 10 years ago. If you think about uh, what do consumers want, if you think about how we need to speak to consumers, if you think about how we need to market to consumers, how we need to sell, uh, how we need to lead and manage a team, how we need to raise money from investors, how we need to position a business for exit, uh, how we go about developing a brand and, and new customers online, the entire game has changed. It's my view that we've got a business world caught up with being professional when I reckon what really works from a brand and a business perspective is being unprofessional. And that doesn't mean being disrespectful or lazy or unpunctual or poorly spoken. What that means is being yourself. It means dropping the mask, dropping the old rule book and going, okay, what works today? And it starts with being real. Um, and let's sort of, let's, let's build businesses in a way that they need to be built in 2014. Yeah. That is, I remember reading the title and it kind of struck me. I'm like, did I read that right? Is it unprofessional? So what, was it, what would you say a time was when you were under your definition of unprofessional that built your brand? Yeah, well, all the time, right? Like if you, if you speak to a professional, and by a professional, I mean someone that dresses up in a suit every day and, 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 and maybe goes to work in their business or yeah. goes to work in another business. You know, professionals... You want the uh, real person. I, I get you what you want. You want that real, genuine person and not kind of buttoned up version, right? It's, it's, it's more so a metaphor for thinking of new ideas that go outside of the box that a usual suit might come up with. So... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a, a professional, for instance, is always trying to be the smartest person in the room. I believe as an entrepreneur, you need to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you are and aim to be the dumbest person in the room at all times. Um, that doesn't mean that you downplay your intelligence. That means that you deliberately seek out people who know more about you in certain fields and surround yourself with those kinds of people. Um, you know, I think while professionals are competing with who's got the larger marketing budget and who can spend more, unprofessionals, you know, new breed entrepreneurs, are creating strategic partnerships with complementary organizations for free in a way which drives them business on a continual basis. Um, while professionals are still posting ads and stuff in, in newspapers and television and wasting however, how, you know, however many millions of dollars, unprofessionals are crafting stories around brand and around existing issues that are in the media right now mm -hmm. and getting PR and media attention from journalists in a way which is free that cuts through the advertising that the professionals are paying for. So there's a number of different ways that we can be unprofessional mm -hmm. um, it, and it starts with doing the exact opposite to what most people do. Yeah, no, I like that. So what was the time when you created that? You were talking about strategic partnership for free that 
you know, that is that unprofessional version. What was an example of one of those times when you created one of those strategic uh, partnerships? You know, M- MBE is a good example of that. You know, I started MBE, I co-founded MBE at the age of 21 with a guy called Ruben Buchanan. Uh, in our second year, we were doing a million dollars revenue. In the coming five years, we raised our clients hundreds of millions of dollars from investors. And that's what the business did. We helped and enabled uh, entrepreneurs and business owners to raise money from investors. Um, now, in year two, how did we generate that revenue? We created one strategic partnership with another organization that had been consulting to businesses in the past around uh, growth and marketing and sales and psychology and all of that sort of stuff. And they had 120,000 um, businesses on their database, mm-hmm. but they'd never been spoke. They'd never spoken to their audience about raising money from investors or building value or positioning your business for exit or anything like that. And that's what we specialized in. And, and I had a bunch of trainers inside of MBE that had been doing that for, for decades. Um, so in crafting a partnership with that organization, what they were marketing our new business you know, to their 120,000 business owners uh, on a regular basis in a way which was literally meaning that we had a line out the door of our office on any a conference, a line outside of the conference um, from people wanting to learn from us and it only took you know, maybe two or three meetings. There was no financial outlay to build the partnership um, but it enabled us to you know, sort of triple our revenue in year two and create what was you know, listed in one of Australia's fastest 50 growing startups on the back of one good partnership. Right. I'm sure a lot of people... And I want to hear, you know, I want to hear about the backstory and how you got to that point because I know it wasn't always that easy um, for for you and in business. But totally. to c- go along those lines with that company, um, was it hard to get in with them? Or did they get approached a lot? What did you do in regards to that? Yeah, absolutely. And and this is the message I always give is that the first thing, and it's the same in capital raising, right? When you go to investors, the first thing people are going to want to see is the experience of you and the experience of your team. So the experience of your team, and that might mean business partners, that might mean board, it might mean advisory board, it might just mean mentors that you utilize. Um, But often, you know, I get asked the question, well, Jack, I I don't know if I can raise money from investors because this is my first business. And I go, that's completely cool. I raised $50,000 for my second business off half a business plan. And the, the way I did that was I leveraged off the bios and the experience and the credibility of the mentors that I had at the time. Um, So the answer to your question is you need to be able to go into any deal with a page of people that are either on your advisory board or on your board or or helping you steer this ship somehow Mm -hmm. and that's going to be the fastest way to get people to have confidence in you. Yeah, yeah. So I want to back up a little bit and find out where this drive and inspiration came from. Tell us a little bit about your influence when you were a child growing up. Yeah, well, um, you know, I always say my business career started at the age of eight and it didn't but it did uh, in that my parents ran a not-for-profit organization called Breaking the Cycle and uh, Breaking the Cycle would take what they call long-term unemployed youth off the street. So the worst of the worst, people that have been in jail, people that had uh, been abused, people that had... Wow. Um, you know, been on and off drugs for years, all, all of that sort of stuff. And they take the worst of the worst and they put them through a three-month uh, training program and then place them into employment. And not-for-profit organization, they were the most successful job placement agency in the country for long-term unemployed youth. Um, the problem was, was that they were reliant on government funding. Government changed the way they distributed funding to these organizations. Breaking the cycle was unsuccessful in bidding for uh, further funding with the government, unsuccessful in trying to find capital elsewhere, uh, and therefore the organisation collapsed. And you know, I literally had uh, kids. I call them kids. I was you know eight, nine, and ten at the time. They were kind of eighteen, nineteen. Um, but we had you know kids living with us. You know, a, a, a guy and a girl living with us that had come through breaking the cycle and become like my brother and sister. Yeah. You know, I'd be spending my weekend at uh, fundraisers and fun runs and all this. You know, raising money for breaking the cycle. So I was really entrenched in this world. And it taught me that there were things in the world that required our attention more so than what I was supposed to be learning at school. And I do mean supposed to be learning because I probably wasn't learning much at school at the time. And secondly, that in my view, it's best, you know, if if you have a vision or a mission or or, or something that you want to push and something that you want to change and something that you want to influence, if you can combine that 
cause and that vision with commercial now, so i.e. a way to actually make money and profit from it, even if it's still a social venture, um, that will give you more steam, it will give you more momentum, it might give you more credibility in some circles. Um, that will see that vision and that mission go further than if we are reliant on the government or reliant on uh, donations from other organizations. Yeah. So, Jack, what was one of those stories from the kids that strikes you that you still think back on of their background and what they had to kind of overcome from that program? Yeah, brilliant question. Um, you know, none of it's pretty. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk to you about Daniel. Just so and people, because who... yeah, because you you know you kind of know what the background is, and people listening, I want them to really picture and feel what that what that means. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, 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 the guy that the kid moved in with us was a guy called Damien and he'd been uh, in and out of jail. He, uh, I can't remember, but he didn't, I can't remember why, but he didn't have a great relationship with his parents uh, and he had a serious history of drug abuse, I- including heroin, right, which right. is obviously, all drugs are incredibly serious, uh, heroin especially so. Um, so... He moved in with us and then he met a girl called Michelle through breaking the cycle who became his girlfriend. She also moved in with us. Very similar story. She hadn't been in, in prison before, um, but she had been involved in, uh, you know, really bad stuff, including drug use. Um, and they needed to be shown that they could be a productive member of society, that they could um, add value to other people, that they could and should value themselves. Uh, that they're worthy of love, you know, just just the most basic stuff that, by the way, you know, today with the entourage, we're like hardcore business education, right? But this is what it stems from, is it stems from enabling people to live life in a way which is true to themselves and often outside of the box and expectations of other people. So similar underlying philosophies, but what I do today is completely separate to all of this sort of stuff in my business work anyway. Um, and through breaking the cycle and, you know, in Damien Michelle's case, through living with us and my family and, you know, I had two brothers at the time and, and, and obviously two parents. Um, and, yeah, they they were shown all of that sort of stuff. You know, they, they learned all of that sort of stuff and that, and that changed their lives. Yeah, I'm sure. And going through breaking, you know, breaking the cycle, I'm sure there were a lot of kids. What do you think made your parents bring them in out of all the people? I'm not sure. I've never asked the question. Mm. I think I think in Damien's case, and, and here's the thing, right, is that so often it's 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 these kids that are, you know, troublemakers and rebellious and all of that sort of stuff. They're they're the kids that have got a bit of charisma about them, you know. They're the kids that have got a bit of flair about them. They're the kids that probably think quite entrepreneurially. Uh, you know, often even on the streets they'll be thinking quite entrepreneurially. Right. You know, I, I remember the first time I met Damien, he, he arrived at our house at like 10 p.m. one one night and uh, my parents brought him in, you know, me and my two brothers were, were asleep and I remember he came in and they woke us up to introduce us to Damien and uh, I, I, I remember, I, I liked him immediately, you know, because he was a good person at heart who hadn't been given the opportunity yet um, to recognize his self-worth and self-value. So uh, my assumption is that was probably it in Damien's case. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when did your first business venture start? My first business venture started at the age of 18 when I uh, dropped out of a commerce law degree down in Melbourne. I now live in Sydney, Australia, and um, borrowed $20,000 from a very reluctant bank. It was like my sixth attempt at borrowing money. and. Um, bought into a business-to-business call center with two other guys uh, down in Melbourne. Um, so there I was, I was 18 years of age, I was the managing director of a business-to-business call center and I literally didn't know what an invoice was. Um, you know, I never had a high degree of talent in business. I had to learn everything from scratch. Um, probably because I never came into business because I had a natural flair for business but because I wanted to change and influence the way we raised and developed young people. Um, so, you know, in terms of leadership and psychology and all of that sort of stuff, I've probably had a little bit of talent in regards to that area. But in regards to business and um, marketing and sales and digital strategy and particularly finance and, you know, all of these sorts of things, uh, I had to literally learn from the ground up. So why call center? Good question. Great question. I hated call centers. 
I'd worked in call centers throughout my teenage years as a salesperson, right? So uh, with my brother Tom, who's, who's since passed away, but uh, oh, sorry Tom to hear and that. I used to. And so Tom and I used to work in a, a call center uh, down in Melbourne throughout you know my teenage years and, and his teenage years as well. He was just three years older than I was, and um, and we would sell you know on the phone or set up appointments or whatever it is. And so you know I had developed this. Hatred for call centers, right? And uh, so why the hell did I then start a business right. yes. in call centers? <laughs> the answer is, is because I had the opportunity to do so. One of the things I talk about in Unprofessional is the stars will never align. There is never a good time to start a business. You won't have the money. You won't have the time. You'll have a husband that you know reckons you should both be in jobs or a wife that doesn't want you to start a business or... Uh, you won't have the qualifications or you'll be too young or you'll be too old or you'll have too much energy or you won't have enough energy. Or, you drink know. too much green tea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in some of our cases. Yeah, still to this day, I've, I've st- I still hold that addiction. But, you know, all, all the reason, I started a call center because one day I called a guy that I worked for on the phone. So I worked for this guy on the phone. I said, you've got a business. I'm sitting here making phone calls for you. Therefore, I'm assuming I'm probably making you money. I want to chat to you about what are you doing while I'm making you money. And he said, come and talk to me. We're going to start a separate call center somewhere else uh, and I want you to be involved in it. Oh, we could talk about having you involved in it. So I went and met him and, 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 and built the conversation. What made you there. call him? I mean, J- just that's that, pretty that, gutsy for an 18-year-old to, to call his boss and say that. Yes, uh, pretty gutsy. Yeah, I think it was, I was fortunate in that when I was aged kind of like 15, um, I had met a very successful entrepreneur. Now, this was a gentleman who was worth about $100 million. Uh, and I, I, we never had any money, me and my family growing up, right? So it was the first time I'd seen like real money. And like I remember walking into this guy's house and it was literally like a, it was, it was the size of a hotel that was, down on the beach in Brighton, you know, called the Golden Mile. And I remember walking in thinking he must be an incredible lawyer or an incredible accountant or a phenomenal doctor or because, you know, I'd, I was still in high school. So in my model of the world at the time, you made money through getting a good education, going to university, getting one of the top degrees and working your way up and becoming a professional. So I go, well, what profession is he in? And, and, and I quickly learned that he was incredibly young at heart. He was also young, you know, he was sort of mid-40s at the time. Um, he, and he hadn't gone to university. He hadn't even finished high school. What he had done is he had gone out, started his own businesses, stuffed up a couple of them, started an IT recruitment company and sold it for $100 million. Oh. Um, yeah, that's sort of 20 years abbreviated right. into one sentence. Um, and so that was the first time I ever saw a vision of a grown-up that I wanted to emulate. Um, how did I know him? He was the father of the girl I was dating. He was the father of my high school sweetheart throughout, throughout high school, who, t- who was actually my girlfriend today as well. Oh. We, we sort of uh, went our separate ways and, and got back together 10 years later. So um, through seeing and meeting, his name was Rod, I, I knew my sort of paradigm around you have to go to school, university, work your way up had been broken because I'd seen an example of someone do the exact opposite who was more successful than anybody else I knew. So um, that is what I suppose gave me permission in my own mind to call Michael one day and go, dude, what are you doing while I'm sitting here making you money? And then that's how it started. So what were some of the lessons learned from the call center that you started? That I didn't know everything. I still don't know everything now. Um, some of the lessons. Number one is is focus. You know, I think a friend of mine, a guy called Creel Price, who started a business with five thousand dollars and a business partner, he sold it ten years later for one hundred and nine million dollars. He calls it the entrepreneur's curse, and that is that often our biggest strength is our biggest weakness, and that is that. As entrepreneurs, our biggest strength is that we're optimistic, we're bullish, we back ourselves and we love to pursue opportunity. However, our biggest weakness is that we love to pursue opportunity and at times we pursue too much opportunity too fast and we think we can do everything at once and we can't. Um, So uh, the first lesson was adopting a focused strategy in terms of don't try and be everything to everyone, don't try and start five businesses 
at the beginning of the race. Uh, don't, you know, don't <laughs> like just the stuff that we were doing was absolutely, you know, very, very naive in how we were operating. So like, give me the example of one of those because people may okay. be listening to this and they may be like, I'm doing that right now. Okay, so this is to the extreme, right? And I don't want anyone to listen to this and go, oh, cool, Jack did that, so therefore I can have as little as focus as I like because this didn't work for years. We had a uh, business-to-business call center. So we had a group of companies. We had a business-to-business call center, which I ran, but then the group that I was part owner in, also we ran uh, a finance company, which we were supposed to be writing mortgages. Uh, We had a property development company where we were looking for ways to develop property. Uh, we had a pasta restaurant down in Elstonwick, Melbourne, if anyone knows Melbourne, in, in Glen Huntley Road. Um, so we were literally like, you know, we had a marketing company, a property company, a finance company, and a pasta restaurant. And they were all starting at exactly the same time. So, um, you know, what hope did any one business unit have of succeeding if you've got a bunch of young guys still relatively inexperienced? By the way, you know, uh, one of the guys that I started those business with is highly successful today because he was learning these lessons at the same time. Michael, the guy I mentioned earlier, highly successful and really respect him as a business owner. But at the time, I was 18 and he was 21. So, you know, how, <laughs> how do you know how to run a business, let alone four, at the age of 18 and 21? Um, and, you know, that's an extreme example. A more common example that we see today because I, through the entourage, we – speak to over 10,000 businesses every single year. And you know it could be better than that but still not great, meaning you might have a personal training company that does public personal training, corporate training, group training, and I would argue that in and of itself is too much to begin with. What I tell early stage business owners is set yourself a benchmark. So until our personal training is profiting, 10K a month, 20K a month, whatever it is. 10K a month is, let's say, that's the minimum. Until your personal training is profiting 10K a month, don't start your corporate training. So, But when the personal training starts to do 10K a month profit, then you start your corporate training. Once that starts to do 10K a month profit, then you start to do the group training. Right. So we need to do it in staged and segmented yeah. ways. Um, so really but, focus you know, in, so you're really focused on one thing, even if it's under the same branch, which those businesses weren't, but even if it's done in the same branch, you're still saying just focus in. Exactly right. Yeah, you, your ability to pick one thing and try and become the best in the world at it will determine how quickly you gain traction in the early days. So how did the call center do? Terribly at the, at the beginning because we were trying to do way too many things. And then at you know in hindsight, what was the bottom of the trough? We made some fundamental shifts to the way we were operating. We got rid of two of the four business units. Michael was going to work on one. I was going to work on the other, which was the business-to-business call center in my instance. Um, Michael was going to do the finance company. And when we started to adopt a focused strategy, we started to get mentors. We started to get better clients. We started to enable our staff better because we could be in the office more because we weren't running around trying to do 62 different things every day. Um, That was the turning point. And then as we were sort of financially able to get ourselves um, back in the black, if you like, we got ourselves back into a position where we were cool and we were profitable and, and we sort of paid off all of the debts that we had incurred along uh, the decline and we were then able to move on. So at that point, we shut down the business-to-business call center and I, I moved on to the second business. So the second business was? The second company was a company called Limitless. Um, so we were down in Melbourne as well running... Uh, we were in all of the universities and a lot of the high schools in Melbourne uh, running workshops for the students because the universities had recognized that a big part of the curriculum they weren't covering was the emotional development stuff, the how do I you know, manage my time, how do I manage my tasks, how do I overcome adversity, how do I bounce back from getting a bad mark, how do I be proactive in my career. All of the soft skills and the life skills and the career skills required with progressing in life and progressing in your career weren't being addressed and so that's what Limitless was doing. I only did Limitless for probably less than a year because I met a guy called Ruben Buchanan um, and similar to what I did with Michael, you know, four years ago, you know, got on the phone and on the emails to Ruben and uh, then we ended up starting MBE Education which was my first, you know, Limitless did well from a cash flow perspective but it it wasn't a multi-million dollar business um, whereas MBE quickly did become one. How did you meet Ruben? 
He uh, was running a workshop down in Melbourne around capital raising. So I just sent him an email saying, uh, you know, mate, I know you're not from Melbourne. I am. I know you don't run conferences. I do. Um, therefore, if you want me to help, help you, let me know. And he said, love you to help me. Ruben had founded a magazine called Wealth Creator Magazine, which is a super prominent magazine here in Australia. And um, therefore, I knew his name from Wealth Creator Magazine. Like from when I was, when I went into business at the age of 18, I was reading Wealth Creator Magazine. So, you know, I, I sort of had Ruben, you know, way up on a pedestal um, at the age of 21. And therefore, uh, really wanted to get to know him. And this is some of what I talk about in the book and some of what I mentioned earlier in terms of getting around people who are smarter than you. You have to, you know, why did I contact Ruben? Because I sat back and I go, man, I'm, I've got the drive. I've got the passion. I'm making a little bit of cash flow. But I'm not playing a seven-figure game and I don't have a multi-million dollar business. And, you know, I look at the, you know, uh, to think of some examples from the States, you look at the Donald Trumps of the world or you look at the Richard Bransons of the world. I, I know that he's from UK. Um, you know, you look at these guys and you go, well, they're playing on a different level. What are they doing that I'm not? Um, and Ruben's skill set was around raising big money from investors, buying businesses, selling businesses. You know, he was playing this seven, eight, nine figure game. Um, and that was a skill set, finance, capital raising, building value, building an asset that can work without you, you know, strategic acquisitions, all of that sort of stuff. That was all a skill set, which at the time of 21, I, I, I didn't have. So I set out deliberately to create a relationship with him. So what was MBE education? We're or an is? education and advisory firm. So we would, uh, we're literally in the process now of merging MBE into the entourage. Again, every year I try and do less and try and adopt an even more focused strategy. So all of the MBE IP and database and clients and all will now be under the one brand. So um, MBE, we were an education and advisory company um, for small to medium-sized businesses that wanted to raise money from investors, acquire businesses or sell businesses, and we were very successful at doing that. And then... Then I want you to talk a little bit about the entourage. And my obvious question, like when I read they have more than 35,000 members is how do you get 35,000 members? Because that's pretty impressive. Yeah, well, the entourage is, is now Australia's largest educator and community of entrepreneurs under 40. So um, how do you get 35,000 members? I think, I think the, 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 the thing with any um, startup, if you like, is you need three things to click. You need to know what market you're in, you need to have a message to market fit and then you need a model that backs up the message to market fit, right? So you've got market, you've got message and you've got model. Um, market in the case of the entourage, you know, prior to starting the entourage and I started the entourage on the back of MBE because we were, you know, the results that we were producing for people at MBE was just incredible, you know. They'd, they'd have a, a couple of meetings with us and, and, and be able to, uh, free up $1.7 million in cash or they'd want to raise half a million dollars to start a business and they'd raise it after doing one investor information evening or they wanted to acquire businesses. You know, we had one guy acquire 11 finance companies in 11 months using wow. none of his own money and giving up no equity. So it was all, it was all debt funded by private investors. Um, so, you know, we were doing these incredible things for these business owners um, and I've I just, you know, my sort of, I suppose, passion and heart has always been with my own generation and, and, and young people, for lack of a better term. So I wanted to start Entourage as a way to, to, to sort of emulate those results for a younger audience. So the market, you know, we identified that entrepreneurs and business owners were highly dissatisfied with universities, TAFEs, other seminar companies, you know, get-rich-quick schemes. There was just nowhere to go to get real business education delivered by people who'd been there, done that experience. Um, so the, the, the market was there and the market demand was there. Our messaging is really strong because we know exactly what we stand for. There's a really strong DNA with the entourage. You know, we want to empower people to win more business, make more money and spend more time doing the things they love. Um, and that is a message that connects with so many because, you know, we're, we're sick of the traditional path of high school, university, get a job, work your way up. You know, the average Australian on, on our superannuation, which in your country I think is the the pension, am I right, that you mm -hmm. retire on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The average Australian re re retires with $71,000 in superannuation. So you work until you're 60 and then you retire with $70,000 to live off until you're, what, 80 or 90 or older. 
so so there's a generation of people that are really disheartened with that thought and and want to forge their own path and then you know model is like anything else you know model took us probably three years to get right and we've now been around for four years um, but when you when you get the right model from a marketing perspective from a brand perspective from a social perspective and from a delivery and financial perspective then the business kind of goes like that and that's when you're able to just push it all that much further yeah I mean what you seem to do very well Jack is you have surround yourself with these mentors and advisors that help launch the company who were some of those mentors and advisors with the entourage yeah well you know in, in the beginning Ruben Ruben Buchanan is still one of my best friends, you know, he's like like my brother up here in Sydney. Um, so he he provided some some great assistance in the early days. Uh, I have another guy. Well, you know, today my advisors are my board, if you like. So people that have invested in acquisitions we've done along the line or whatever. I, I, I really just use my board today and some other people casually. But you know, four years ago now. It would have been Room Buchanan, uh, another guy called Peter Davison, who was one of the seed funders in PayPal. He came in at a valuation of 500k, and then they obviously sold to eBay for 1.5 billion. Um, you know, invested into Peter Thiel in the early days. Um, <clears throat> another guy called Stuart Cook, who's the CEO of a, a, a franchise over here, a Fresh Mex franchise called Zambrero. They, they were like Australia's fastest growing franchise four years in a row recently. He's an investor and he's on my board and one of my best mates. Um, so those were probably the core ones. There's heaps more, um, but you know what what I what I used to do was I'd I'd look at what's every area of business. You know, if you if you talk about unprofessional, there's it's broken down into eight different core areas, right? So everything from vision to startup to uh, marketing, sales, online strategy, management and leadership, finance, and then the venture capital type stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I, I deliberately looked at all of those eight areas, and this is probably six years ago, and gone, who could I find that could teach me more than I could ever hope to know over 10 years in that particular field? Who could teach me more than I could ever hope to know in 12 months? And then I'd um, build a genuine, human, honest, open relationship with, with, with really great people, and that, that, was my, that was my apprenticeship. And Jack, I remember hearing a story. I think it was... Um, you're doing another interview and you talked about an accountant who was giving you advice. Do you remember that? Yeah. You're smiling. Because yeah. <laughs> this goes into your unprofessional theme and some of the advice yes. you get and who you ask for advice and, and how you take it. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I was actually, uh, someone raised that interview with me recently. And in the interview, I actually said it happened once. I, I've since remembered it's actually happened to me twice in... Two, and I, I won't go into which businesses they are, but two uh, companies that, that I've had in the past and currently have that have, have become hu hugely financially successful, like multi-million dollar companies, in both instances. And so here's the thing, right? Remember I spoke before about uh, market message model. Uh, in, I reckon it takes two years to get those elements to line up to build a profitable business. Some instances three years, some instances five years, some instances six months. If you really, you know, if you really hit it, or you've got experience in a particular industry, or, or you know, we just, you know, we're fortunate in that particular play. Um, but it, it takes time, and your business is going to go like this, and then it'll go like this, and it'll keep doing that, and then one day maybe when you line up all those three factors, it will go something like that. The trick is that when you're here, just before the point that we're going. Like, the trick is that it looks like there's been, if you were to look at a P&L for the last two years and you were an accountant, you'd go, what are you doing? You know, why, go, go, go and get a job. Like, you, you're not profiting, you, you, you're taking this really small wage from the business or, you know, you're not taking any money from the business. Is that what they told you? This, this, is, this is exactly what they told me. And, and, and questioning uh, the validity of the models and questioning uh, whether it was worthwhile. And, and, and so I'm sitting there and, you know, at the time I'm like just 24-year-old trying to be an entrepreneur, you know, like I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. You know, like it's um, – and, you know, I had sort of built MBE by the time I was 24, but I was still obviously very young. Trying to explain the concept of 
this is business, right? It takes years and years and years to build the foundation. Then bang, one day you start to get what I, you know, my favorite thing in business is momentum. Um, and it's just, just they can't get that, unfortunately. And so you were talking about too then. So who, at that time, how did you know not to take that advice? Because you were still kind of, you know, in that upward trajectory, maybe not hit the, the hockey stick growth. Well, because I'd done it once with MBE, so I knew that principle. Uh, I was deliberately building this particular company in a way where we wanted a really solid infrastructure. So by the time we got to, let's say, two years, we wanted a really solid infrastructure that could scale. You know, by infrastructure, I mean a uh, set of costs. So wages, premises, all of that sort of stuff, all, all of our cost of sales. We wanted a really solid infrastructure and foundation that could scale to, let's say, uh, you know, you. Our cost base would be there, we'd be doing a million dollars revenue. That same cost base could scale to $10 million revenue with a minimal increase in cost. So I was b deliberately building a really good foundation uh, so that when the revenue did start to spike, that is where we would start to see profit. So it was a deliberate play. Like that's, that's what I was always planning to do. Um, and I was just using the wrong accountant uh, who wasn't very entrepreneurial and only saw the P&L and didn't see past that and didn't understand strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. The, the, the problem with that, Jeremy, and why, why I raised it in the interview that you saw is because if, if that was my first business or if I uh, had have not been confident or if I hadn't have surrounded myself with highly entrepreneurial people earlier on that said, um, you know, this is, a, this is a really valid and warranted play you know it's completely normal businesses do this all the time if if either of those had of or had of not been true then i might have chucked in the business three months away from mass scale momentum and profitability so so that's really dangerous i think and i think it's really important that as entrepreneurs you only take advice from people who are financially successful in the field that they are talking to you about and understand business strategy as it is in today's world yeah and I want to hear, you know, kind of how it relates to unprofessional, but I want to ask about your favorite story from unprofessional, but I just want to hold up the cover for one second. I want to just take a, another look and have everyone take a look. Um, so how many different layouts did you go with before choosing that one? That's actually a really funny story. We, uh, we had a cover um, and uh, we sent the cover off and it came back with a whole bunch of really bad feedback from a bunch of people that needed to like the book. Uh, so we then had about 24 hours to redo the cover. Um, and so within 24 hours, we had a branding agency come up with that, which was about a million times better than the first cover. So it was an absolute headache for about 24 hours, but uh, it was definitely a positive because we got a better end result. Like, show me what what um, did they not like before, and what's on there now? So prior, we had a uh, image of a slingshot, which was uh, a metaphor. And I thought of this before. Um, uh, what's his name? He just wrote David and Goliath. Oh, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell. Yeah. yeah, I thought of this before that came out. Right, um, there was this. There was a slingshot, and it was a metaphor for. David and Goliath and what Malcolm Gladwell would call improbable victory. Um, so we had that instead of my ugly mug on the cover and the metaphor got lost somewhere along the line. So it didn't, it didn't reflect the message that uh, was intended. So uh, we changed it. Got it. I always find it interesting of why people choose certain things on the cover and why they're there. So, yeah. So I always like stuff like, you know, we called the entourage the entourage because we wanted something that said like underground movement, revolution, um, bunch of people moving toward one common objective without saying any of that sort of stuff. So I always like sort of, you know, things that reflect uh, an underground movement and, and particularly, you know, in, in the case of the slingshot, uh, improbable victory. Um, so that's where I was going for. But uh we needed something that was a bit more self-explanatory. Got it. So yeah. what's one of your favorite stories from the book? My favorite story from the book is the story that I conclude with. Um, and it's a story about uh, in 1903 on the 17th of December at 10.35 a.m., Orville Wright uh, took off in a paddock 
uh, in North Carolina, USA. Um, he had won a coin toss with his brother uh, a couple of hours before that to be the one that would actually be in that uh, vessel, if you like, that was going to take off and attempt to fly. Um, and they did fly. Uh, and today, Orville and his brother, the Wright brothers, are obviously uh, accredited with being the fathers of modern aviation. And I talk about this story for a few reasons. The first one is is to realise that neither Orville nor his brother had a high school education, had a university education, but the people they were competing with to launch the first flight uh, had, you know, engineering qualifications and all of these different qualifications that the Wright brothers just didn't have. The second reason it's significant is because it's so insignificant. That first flight that crowned them with being the fathers of modern day aviation uh, was a 37 metre flight for 12 seconds. So you can literally look it up on Wikipedia. I don't know if it's on YouTube, but you know you see Orville running along this mat in a paddock, and his brother's hanging onto a wing because his brother's going to help project him off as well. And then he flies for uh, you know 37 meters for 12 seconds. Um, and the lesson there is that you know I think the main thing that stops people from starting businesses is they don't think they can start a great company, um, and perhaps they don't give themselves permission to be the person that could start a great company. And as I said before, when I started a call center, even though I hated call centers, you know, the way you start won't be uh, the way the business is five years from now. Right. Um, the way you start will probably be pre pretty crappy in rel relative to your standards for yourself, you know, because there's mm. a gap. We want to be this good, but when we start out, we're this mm. good. And then we go, oh, we're no good at this, so we chuck in the towel. Yeah. Um, so just a metaphor for start somewhere. Yeah. Um, kind of like third, chapter three, uh, start before you're ready. Exactly right. You yeah. know, start before you're ready and, and give yourself permission. And, and the third reason I think that story is significant is because they didn't have a pilot's license. They didn't have an aviation qualification. How could they? They were doing something that was brand new. The industry didn't exist yet. So... In entrepreneurship, it's about looking forward. If university teaches you the way things have always been done, entrepreneurship is about doing things the way they've never been done. So by virtue of that, nobody else can give you permission. You've just got to go out and do it yourself. And even if it's just a 37-meter flight that lasts 12 seconds, mm -hmm. start somewhere. And you know, what I reckon is really cool is did Orville and his brother um, ever envision that aviation would be where it is today? You know, that a flight can go from Sydney to Chicago, right. um, you know, in this big tin thing and we're sitting there it's drinking amazing. red wine and watching movies in these planes. Yeah. Did they ever have, you know, because my suspicion is that they probably never envisioned such a grand vision for where aviation could go. But it started with one paddock in 1903 and two brothers and 12 seconds. So did the person who won the coin toss actually want to fly in the plane? Yes. That's true? Yeah. Yeah. I would not want to fly in the plane. Like, this is untested. Why don't you <laughs> you fly in the plane? <laughs> yeah, I think I think they were pretty hungry. Yeah. But, you know, like I, I don't imagine it was a very high height. I don't I don't imagine it was very dangerous Still. because it only went for thirty seven <laughs> meters, right? Shows my adventure <laughs> meter. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so what Jack, I know a lot of stuff that you put in um, can't make it in the book. What's one of your favorite stories um, from your experience that, that got cut out? Um, That's why this interview is going to be so valuable because they can't get this in the book. You know? Okay. Yeah. So pressure's on. Yeah. Pressure's on. What they cut, you know, because obviously they changed the cover. You can't include all these story, good stories from your career in the book. What didn't make it? Um... I'm just trying to think. Um, what didn't make it? Uh, we can. Can we edit out this long pause? No, I, I conclude everything. This is uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's unedited. Um, Thanks you for know, the support. Appreciate what, it. <laughs> It's like, what's, what was painful? Like, it's sort of like the slingshot, right? Because you had this great idea. You had thought about it for a long time. And mm -hmm. then they cut it and they want you to put something different. Was there a story that you were just so passionate about? And maybe, there, maybe there's no answer to this. Maybe there wasn't 
um, that you loved and that you're, it came back with the feedback that you had to cut it out. It was almost painful for you to take it out. So I, I had complete sort of creative direction over the book. So nothing was cut out that I didn't want to be cut mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. no, nothing was edited in a way that I didn't want it to be edited. Um, what about this? Was there any feedback from your girlfriend or someone close to you that was a little hurt? That hurt, stung a little bit when they give you feedback when they when they looked it over. This is such a cop out, but no, the feedback's been really good. <laughs> um, the, and the I don't want to create like a tension between you and anyone you you love, but I'm just I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, the thing with this is there's like 110 sub chapters in this book, right? So it's written in real like every every sub chapter is like a blog post. So it's really short, sharp anecdote stories, do this strategies, models, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So in in order to write it, I just came up with a massive list of all the different stories and inclusions and models and uh, tips and tricks that I wanted to to convey. And 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 so it's like a collation of all of these different things, right? Which is why I'm struggling, and I know this is a cop out, but I'm struggling to come up with, with something that I've missed. The only thing I can think of, there, okay, there's one thing that I missed. I think I'd need to go back and check the book, but I think, I think I probably didn't include the story about how I got my first really well-known interview when I started the Entourage. So, the Entourage was based on a premise of learn from the world's best entrepreneurs. That's what the whole thing was based on. So in order to start doing that, what I wanted to do was start interviewing the world's best entrepreneurs, film it and start distributing it and that was going to be uh, the way we demonstrated value and built all of this intellectual property that was going to just kill all of the other business uh, intellectual property that was out there. How I got my very first interview was with a lady called Janine Alice who created a company called Boost Juice which I think is actually over in the States now, but Janine started it. She was, you know, juicing juices in Adelaide, which is, the, you know, like a small city in Australia. Um, and 10 years later, she sold 65% of it for $70 million. Wow. So, you know, household brand here in Australia. It was her first business. She was a mum, you know, just she, again, a, a great story of improbable success. And um, the way I got an interview with Janine which started off you know most of my media stuff was I called up a magazine and I've gone if I can get an interview with Janine Alice will you give me a double page spread and they go if you can get an interview with Janine Alice we will definitely give you a double page spread I call up Janine Alice's PA and I say I'm Jack DeLosa I write for such and such magazine um, we would like to do a double page spread on Janine uh, is she available to do an on-camera interview? And they said, you know, given that you're a journalist for such and such magazine, of course she's available for an interview. So it was, and this is this is the way it's been throughout my entire career. Is and and the same is true for any entrepreneur. Is you've got this chicken and egg thing. You know, you want the interview, but you don't have the distribution, and you want the distribution, but you don't have the interview yet. Right. Or you want 300 people to come to your conference, you don't have the speakers. And you can't get the speakers unless there's going to be 300 people at your conference. Right. Or you want the investor to invest $500,000 with you. You don't have profit. And then, you know, in order to generate profit, you need him to invest him or her to invest $500,000 with you. So there's always these chicken and egg scenarios, right? So um, I think an entrepreneur's ability to uh, build that picture and create that story and uh, strategize how they're going to put into play all of these different aspects that don't yet exist is the true ability of an entrepreneur. I think that the number one thing we do as entrepreneurs is we, we tinker with the universe that doesn't yet exist. So it's the entrepreneur that can best tinker with that universe and then communicate that universe effectively is the entrepreneur that wins. So that was just a little guerrilla kind of tactical way that I got my first interview yeah. which led to my second interview which led to writing for a second magazine and the third magazine and awards and all of this sort of stuff. But it started with two phone calls. Jack, that story was worth the wait so I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the longest awkward pause I've ever had in an interview. So. You know what, when it's real and it's unedited. That's fine. You know, there's going to be pauses. So that's that's what makes it unprofessional. That's what makes it real. That's very good. You know what point, I mean? Um, like so it. tell me what's been, it seems like for the most part, things have been an up, upward trajectory. What's been a painful low point in business for you? Um, there's been heaps. There's been, 
you know, I, it surprises me. It doesn't, but, you know, maybe I need to alter the way I tell the story. But it surprised me that you say it sounds like there's been a lot of upward trajectory. And I suppose there has in the last few years. But, you know, I think that for the first three, four years of anybody's business journey, it's going to be like 98% difficult, stressful setbacks, uh, people saying no, people not coming on board with you, people not investing with you, media saying go away, why would we talk to you, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So three days prior to starting my first business, which was the Business Business Call Center, my brother Tom, who I mentioned before, passed away as a result of drug use. It wasn't an overdose, mm. but he'd taken some drugs and he, is, he asphyxiated. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah, yeah, so it was really crap. And um, uh, three days later, so that was the Friday, three days later on the Monday, we started this call center, right? And the call center didn't have any real milestone or any real form of success for about 12 months. So, you know, for that 12 months, you know, I'm kind of dealing with uh, the passing of my brother. I didn't really know how to deal with uh, somebody passing away at that point. So I did it. really painful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there's, like anything, I think there's a, a, a right way you know, it's an individual thing, right? But there's a right way to do it and, and a wrong way to do it. And the wrong way to do it is ignore it and pretend it never happened and go on with building your business anyway. And that's what I did for about six months. So six months in, you know, I remember I was driving home from work one day and I was literally uh, j- sitting in my car. It was a great car, by the way, because we were releasing all of this stuff that we couldn't afford. Sitting in the car at a red light and I just started crying. And to, uh, to this day, I couldn't tell you why I started crying. It was like any other day, any other work day. I wasn't particularly stressed that day. I wasn't particularly sad that day. I hadn't been thinking about Tom that day, but I was sitting there at, at, a, at a red light and just started crying uncontrollably to the point where, you know, I'm still living at home at this point, which is another reason why it's good to start a business early because you go home and mum gets dinner. That um, is a perk. That is a massive perk. Um, you know, to the point where I went home and, and I couldn't even stop crying before I went in and, you know, usually I don't like my parents seeing me down and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, just this uncontrollable release and grief and sadness, right? So that is one of the low points where the stress and the lack of progress and the lack of self-worth and the lack of self-esteem and grieving of stuff that's happened in your personal life and it just all gets to a point where you go, I have no idea but my body and my soul and my emotions aren't happy right now and there's not much I can do to improve it in this moment so I'm just going to cry, you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Down moment. That's intense. And mm. so how do you get over that? Because that's such a tough thing to, to experience. Yeah, How do you bounce I think, back? I think the more respect you can, the more respect and time and energy and focus you can give to your emotions, the more they will serve you. So, what I learned from that experience and a whole bunch of other experiences is that negative emotions will start as a whisper. It'll start by going, you know, you're not really happy right now, or you're not doing the right thing right now, or, you know, someone's just passed away, you should probably give that some time and think about it and grieve and cry and talk to your family about it. And then it gets, and you don't acknowledge it, it gets a little bit louder and then it gets a little bit louder and then it gets a little bit louder and then it gets a little bit louder and it gets to the point where, you know, you're almost at the mercy of these, call them negative, even though they're not negative emotions um, because you haven't given them the time and the respect that they deserve. Emotions, when I say they're not negative, I, I genuinely believe there is no negative emotion because they're all just signals, right? If you're stressed, it's a signal that you need to get organized and perhaps you know structure stuff better and plan better. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're overwhelmed, same thing. You probably need to structure stuff and, and plan some stuff. If you're worried, it's a signal that, you okay, you need to start preparing for a particular event that you're worried about. So, you know, today I love um, these negative emotions because that's me telling myself that something needs attention and that something needs to change. Mm. When I was 18, I hadn't learned that yet. Um, so I tried to switch off my emotions and ignore them, and, and that didn't work for me. Yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that. That's, that's really mm. personal. Mm. Now, going from that low point, Jack, to the – tell me about a proud moment, 
something that you were just like that amazed that you accomplished? Mate, I think the the thing that I am most proud of is the team that we've managed to build here at the Entourage. Uh, you know, we've now got a full time staff base of about twelve staff, uh, and then we've got advisors and trainers and board members and you know contractors all around the world. We've probably got about thirty different people that are involved in the organisation. Um, but you know, e- everybody that's involved. I, I walk into this office, you know, I'm not in here every day anymore. Um, but when I do walk into this office, everybody from uh, the CEO to the operations manager to our client relations manager to our entrepreneur development managers to our advisors, these are people that just absolutely inspire me every single time I talk to them or speak to them because they're high energy, they're incredibly positive people, they're incredibly powerful people. Uh, they're going above and beyond every single day to build the entourage into a great company and to push the movement forward. They love what they do. They're respectful. They're hungry to learn. You know, just funny as all hell. You know, they're just the best people in the world, right? And so sometimes, you know, at a Christmas dinner or, you know, we do drinks, you know, most Friday nights or if we go on a holiday together, you know, I, I literally sit there and I look around and I go, man, like I'm just so incredibly lucky and fortunate to be surrounded by such great people yeah and i have one last question for you jack and i really appreciate your time but before i ask it just tell us a little bit more about what's going on now with entourage and the book you know just tell people where they can find it where, where, where should they go yeah, best place to find the book is on booktopia.com. So if you if you just punch into Google Jack DeLosa Unprofessional Booktopia, B-O-O-K-T-O-P-I-A, um, you can buy the book there. It's currently 20% off as well because we're coming up to launch. So you can get the book for like literally 20 bucks and it comes with like thousands of dollars worth of bonuses that you can get once you buy the book. Um, so that's super exciting and the, you know the, the response from – uh, you know, the 200 entrepreneurs that we've already given it to has been absolutely incredible. Um, in terms of the entourage, you know, we um, are looking at, we're starting to look at other markets and we're starting to look at, uh, we're, we've developed a five-year curriculum now. So, you know, historically we've had like a two-year curriculum that's becoming a five-year curriculum in terms of what businesses will learn for our scalable and saleable program and that will be exported to other markets in the coming years as well. So, for us, you know, from an entourage perspective, you know, focus is always the big thing on, on my priorities list. So it's about now the education model here in Australia and then we'll start looking at other markets. Yeah. By the way, anyone can be, uh, become a free member of the entourage. It's uh, www.the-entourage.com.au. You can sign up, subscribe for free um, and be kept in the loop with all the stuff that we're doing. So what other sites, we'll link that up. What other sites should we link up? Uh, really, the, the two main ones are the-entourage.com.au and jackdelosa.com. Um, both of those websites will give you videos and interviews and articles and models and strategies that will enable you to build a multi-million dollar company very quickly. Um, and yeah, heaps of cool resources and both are completely free. Yeah. So Jack, I have one last question and it kind of Go goes full circle. Don't be worried. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you could tell good, yeah. <laughs> no, um, you know, it comes full circle from the beginning and, and the unprofessional and everything like that. I want to know what, you know, after you went through a lot of tough times, low points, and a lot of, it took a lot of work, time, and energy to build these businesses. Tell me about the most exciting thing. You know, I said we have a self made millionaire, two multi million dollar companies. What's the most exciting thing you did or bought for yourself because of that? Something fun. <laughs> you mean in terms of something I've bought that's costed a lot of money? Maybe, maybe, yeah. Maybe you went on a certain trip. Maybe you bought a certain material good because of that success. <laughs> <laughs> that question is really easy to answer. Um, so we now do trips with our clients. So our main program in the entourage is called Scalable and Sayable and and it's a super part-time. Everybody in the program is an incredibly busy entrepreneur. 
Um, but it's exactly what they need to learn, what they need to know, when they need to know it in order to progress their businesses forward. Twice a year, we go on a round-the-world trip with these guys. Wow. Um, now, that's not something that, that I pay for. They, they, they pay for themselves and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but we do um, enable our staff to come. So, you know, in December, we had uh, 50 people, 50 of our clients go to Bali as well as like six of our team members go to Bali. Nice. Um, and that's kind of a moment where you're sitting around with, you know, 56 people in Bali. You know, June is going to be Vegas. Um, 56 people in Bali, similar to the connection I outlined before that we have with our staff base here in terms of positive, encouraging, respectful, hungry to learn, similar ambition, similar challenges, similar lifestyle, all of that sort of stuff. You get 60 people like that together in a location like Bali or Vegas. The, the magic that that provides you is so much more than the motorbike that you buy or the car that you buy or the watch that you buy or the whatever that you buy, right? Um, it's, it's, it's really funny, you know, everyone, everyone always says, you know, money doesn't buy happiness and all of that sort of stuff. And I remember sort of hearing that as I was growing up and, and, and starting out in business going, pretty sure it does, you know. Like, <laughs> or the sure saying is people who say that don't have money or, you know, people <laughs> yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that for the most part, it's really true because the things that you buy when you've become financially successful – a, a really, really unfulfilling. Like you can buy something super expensive you always wanted to buy and you kind of go, oh, you know, that's, that's that and then you move on. But, but when it can give you an experience like Bali or like Vegas or like, uh, you know, just with our internal team last year, we flew everyone to Thailand for, for a week in January to start off the year. We, you know, we wanted to sort of give everyone a really cool experience to start off the year. When you can do stuff like that that enriches the lives of the people around you and builds relationship, that's where you go, it was really, really worthwhile and this is how money and success should be done. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, thank you, Jack. That wasn't the, the answer I was expecting, but I love that answer. Jack, I want to be the first one to thank you so much for your time and energy. I know you're a busy man, and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Too easy, Jeremy. That was a bloody good interview, mate. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having Thanks. me.